that's how warfare is going to be fought. I think in the next war, it's going to be setting the AIs loose on each other. And so we are literally just sheltered down and these gods are fighting above us. And we have no idea what they're doing in real time. We can probably intervene in our human scale um, here and there, um, at least in the near term. But of course, to make them effective, uh, it's not hard to see. You'll have to actually let them operate in their own time scale to be effective at combating the other AIs. So you're going to have them let them make decisions in their own time frame, which is going to be a million times faster than human decision making. So effectively hit the button and they become autonomous agents. And then they become these gods fighting in the heavens above us. And do we survive or not? That's the question. You know, it really becomes a kind of scenario. How can I help? How can I be useful in ending needless suffering? Do not be afraid of work that has no end. We have to organize a social movement. We have an opportunity to lead by example versus just talking, hot air. I think the more people in this fight, the more we grow. Eventually you could change. You know, the people are the ones that can make the change. Welcome back everybody to season two of Change Agents. Today, we're talking about AI, artificial intelligence. Recently, over 33,000 people, including tech leaders like Steve Wozniak and Elon Musk, have signed the Future of Life Institute's open letter to pause large AI experiments for at least six months. There are concerns that artificial intelligence may get so powerful that humans would be unable to stop it if it decided to turn against its makers. A 2023 survey of AI experts revealed that 36% of them fear that AI development may result in a nuclear level catastrophe. My guest today is Tamlin Hunt. He is one of those people trying to raise the alarm. He's a public policy lawyer, an author, and a scholar. He is also an affiliate guest in psychology at the University of California, Santa Barbara's Meta Lab, where he focuses on topics like the philosophy of mind and cognitive science. His work covers several disciplines, including renewable energy, neuroscience, philosophy, consciousness, foreign policy, and artificial intelligence. Do you happen to remember when it changed for you? And my words, not necessarily yours, correct me if I'm wrong, but when it went from being interested to in, uh, in AI to perhaps being concerned about the potential consequences of it, was there a watershed moment or was it just a volume of information that uh, that made that change for you? It was really chat GPT. You know, I'd actually used um, earlier versions of GPT. I believe I used GPT-3. I read a very interesting piece a couple of years ago in the, um, the Mercury um San Jose Mercury, and um, it was about GPT-3 and a guy who was engaged and then his fiance died, and he used his GPT-3, which was in you no know, limited release at the time, to basically recreate his fiance with information he fed into it. And it was actually really poignant and extremely impressive in terms of the output. I then tried it myself and found it very, very unimpressive. So again, I put it away like, okay, I don't know what they did in that particular case. I don't think I'm lying, but my use of it was not very impressive. Then along comes ChatGPT in November of 2022, almost a year ago. And it is, according to everyone who uses it, I think if you're you know, appropriately setting your bar, um, extremely impressive. And it's gotten only more impressive. Of course, there's been some discussion in the last month or two about some abilities have actually gotten worse, I think because of changes they made to the internal workings in terms of mathematics in particular uh, but in general it's gotten better and better and if you use 4.0 and if you use anthropics claude 2 you know or bard what have you they're all extremely good at natural human language and going from having an impressive you know screen output in terms of a conversation with a computer and being impressed by its you know its natural language ability to thinking it's going to take over the world is a big leap right but what we do when we think about exponential growth and where things go is you need to reasonably extrapolate those trends into the future and so obviously not only um me or roman Yampolsky, my co-author have been doing this a lot of folks have been doing this 
and a lot of people have signed these various letters, you know, warning about these issues and you know, literally using terms like civilizational risk, existential risk, this kind of thing. has gotten a lot of attention um, in a good way because these are very serious issues when you do look at the growth of uh, capacity in these particular software tools called LLMs. And when there's a trend toward AGI, artificial general intelligence, they become much more um, adept at doing things in the world, not just outputting text in impressive human language. Yeah, so I'm a layman when it comes to anything in the AI field, self-described layman. I encountered or discovered ChatGPT actually earlier this year, and it was because I kept hearing about it, and I host um, a podcast outside of Change Agents, and a friend of mine was talking about how much time he was able to save. And so, if, <laughs> tell me more. We all have the same 24 right. hours in a day. Yeah. What is it that you're doing? And he was explaining to me the using ChatGPT to help with not a perfect output of a podcast title or description, but the ability to aggregate information, summarize all these things. So I started playing around with it, which, which led me to things like Mid Journey, which is, if I'm being totally open, the limit of my AI exposure. And I'm already over my head drowning, understanding how to use these things anyway. In my mid to late forties, I'm not so sure I was the target audience for these <laughs> creativity, you know, for these creative tools. But it's interesting. I can. It's certainly not perfect. You know, Chat GPT uh, was a language learning model, and then you talked about general AI. For me, large learning, large language model, large language oh, wow. model. For me, I get lost sometimes in in the weeds of what's the difference between the two and where the overlay is. And even though I and I don't have the ability to precisely describe that, you hear things about people like Jeffrey Hinton, who quits his job at Google, and he's considered to be you know the godfather of AI. But he quits his job over concerns about the dangers of AI. Can you unpack what his specific concern is, probably more concisely mm. than I could? Because what worries me yeah. is when people who are involved with the inception of these things are the ones mm -hmm. saying we should pump the brakes and nobody else seems to be listening. They seem to be asking for chat GPT 4.5 as opposed to tapping yeah. the brake pedals. It starts to worry me, especially when I'm literally, the, my pool of knowledge is about a thimble deep. Well, yeah, so Jeffrey Hinton um, is a pioneer in um, AI and in particular in LLM models and other types of kind of deep learning um, LLMs again are large language models, and this is you know what ChatGPT is. It's an LLM. Um, Anthropic is Claude Two, Google's Bard, um, Microsoft Sydney, et cetera. These are all LLMs, and Chatbot is the you know common phrase we'll use. Um, but Chatbot can be a lot of different things as well as LLMs. So I generally want to use LLM as a phrase here. Hinton was at Google for some time, and um, he quit not because he thought Google was being irresponsible, and he's made this very clear in his public statements. He quit because he wanted to be able to basically warn about the dangers of this technology without worrying about the impact on his employer and therefore the impact on himself. And so he basically retired, and he's now a public speaker, and he's very articulate. And um, you know, anyone interested in, in learning, you know, more about what he said can Google it and find his speeches very easily. But the really short version is that. Um, he worries about the pace of change, what I've mentioned already. The pace of change has become so rapid. Um, most technologies that rely on information will go through an S-shaped curve in improvement. And so in terms of their ability, in this case, you know, the ability to process information and to be intelligent, um, which are you know, comparable but not the same things, um, they'll start at this kind of low rate of growth, that kind of low tail of the S. Then they'll start turning upwards and they'll go almost vertical for some time. And then they'll level off and you'll see another similar shaped tail at the top, like, an, like a kind of a flat S called the logistical uh, growth curve. And so we appear to be in the bottom of that vertical growth curve. So we've gone 50 years now in developing AI tools, and it was very unimpressive for a long time. You know, you read about these new things and you try them, and they were kind of a joke. Uh, the competitions were, you know, trying to imitate like an immigrant 13-year-old boy. And could you convince a human user that this computer um, 
mimicking a 13 year old immigrant boy was in fact a human or a computer. So they're very limited cases, but then along comes, you know, chat GPT and its um, successors. And they are extremely good at human language. And we often forget this um, key detail. What they're outputting is not only very accurate and very detailed and very convincing of its ability to use language, it's also extremely fast. Oh, yeah. They can put out an essay, a three-page essay, in five seconds. That would take any intelligent human six, eight, 10, 12 hours to do that. So they're already far faster at doing what we do. Um, I'm not saying they do the same things we do. They do it in different ways, obviously, but their output, when you compare an essay written by ChatGPT versus, let's say, a college kid, they're often hard to tell apart nowadays. And oftentimes the ChatGPT essay is going to be a lot better written than the college kid <laughs> writing the essay. It's going to have better um, references that's, for that's sure. That's pretty remarkable, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, here we are. You know, so Hinton is basically saying, look, the pace of change here, when you extrapolate forward and you go from being as smart as a college kid, but way, way faster, let's say two years in the future, you're now as smart as a college professor, but way, way faster. Another year or two, you're as smart as Albert Einstein, but way, way faster. Where does it go? There's no upper end. There's no upper limit to it. So when you have tools that are way, way smarter than you and you're attempting to build in limits on what they can do to make sure they don't do bad things, when they're way, way smarter than you, they can anticipate anything you will do. And if they want to, for whatever reason, they will undermine your attempts to limit them. So that's where the fear comes from. It reminds me of some of the science fiction, fiction movies I've seen in the past. The one that comes to mind, I believe it was Will Smith and iRobot. Mm -hmm. And it was, and I think I've seen versions of this except for in the James Cameron uh, Terminator series because those clearly did not have a rule that they couldn't take human life. Those things were <laughs> out to take <laughs> over. <laughs> but it's this concept in those movies, and maybe it's, an, maybe it's a way for them to soften the idea of AI, but they often talk about the prime directive or something in the software that would prevent or ensure safety, I guess that would be the, the best way to think about it. What you're describing is something that is far more intelligent than us that would probably forecast we would try to do something like that and either create a backdoor or just have a way around it, which I don't think would work out incredibly well for us. I agree. You know, that's why I'm doing what I'm doing in terms of warning about this stuff because um, every company out there now is claiming, of course, to develop, you know, safe products and, and concern being, they're being, they're acting concerned about safety. Are they truly? I think they are. I don't think they're bad people, but they are people driven by, in most cases, a motive to be the first, yeah. to make a lot of money, to ensure your power, what have you. So all these motivations basically weigh in favor of hitting the gas as, as hard as possible and worrying about safety second. And so, for example, OpenAI, the company behind ChatGPT, um, issued what they call their Super Alignment Initiative about a month ago. And they are committing 20% uh, of their computing power and a fair amount of money and brain power to developing um, solutions to AI safety. This is called the alignment problem in the field or the control problem. Um, so that then allows them to say, look, we're doing this over here. Now let's please proceed on developing the products we want to put out there and continue our dominance in the AI field, make a lot of money, make a lot of change, be prominent, uh, be in all the TV shows, et cetera. And so there's a real risk that people will be lulled by the uh, performative um, elements of seeking solutions and then trusting, oh, okay, smart people are on the job. Uh, they're working on solutions. I can sleep now at night without, you know, worrying too much. Well, we're arguing in our work. So I think you reached out because um, Roman Yampolsky and I wrote an essay recently in Nautilus, basically arguing that there is no solution to this problem. And so it's because of what I kind of laid out already is that there is a certain trust among the industry uh, for the various, you know, incentives I just mentioned that we can find solutions if we try hard throw enough you know, resources at the problem, we'll find solutions we always have in the past, we'll do it again in this case. But this is a very different problem. You know, it's the most difficult problem ever faced by humanity. And we're arguing 
we know already enough to know there is no solution. How can you possibly control an entity that is a million times more intelligent than you? And then a billion times more intelligent than you. And the analogy we draw, one of many is, how could you think that an ant on an NFL football field can control the game around it? You can't. Yeah. And then that, that's the comparison. We become ants to the feet of his AI gods very quickly. And so we're saying, look, pause, slow down, stop and think about what you're doing. And basically, if you agree after this pause and deep think that there is no real solution, let's set up policy agencies to limit AI to certain types of tools, what we call narrow AI. We had to forego AGI, artificial general intelligence, as a technology, technology category because it's simply too dangerous. In the same way we said for now 70, 80 years that rogue nations cannot have nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. This is too dangerous. We cannot allow it because our survival depends on it. In the same way we're saying we cannot allow any company or nation to develop AGI because it's simply too dangerous. That's an interesting compare and contrast between limiting nuclear weapons and limiting information in in technology. I could I could see, I would like to believe the United States first world, many countries would after a pause realize that there needed to be some level of oversight, some level of restriction. And I could see people arguing against it, saying that, well, uh, rogue nation state actors would probably use uh, China, North Korea examples that would be considered enemy to a large portion of the first world, depending on whatever your lens is. Well, they're not doing that. So if we do, we are therefore going to be at a disadvantage. And I'm not arguing for that at all. It's just unfortunate that we might rush towards our own demise through the argument of, well, they're doing it, so we have to as well, which is an argument that I used to get from my five-year-olds, and it's really easy to defeat. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, and you're exactly right. That is the argument we hear oftentimes. And this is, this is I think, the prevailing argument currently in the U.S. You know, national defense uh, community is that, look, if we don't do it, China's going to do it. Russia is going to do it. We have to do this to maintain um, our dominance in this area. And I think the way that unfolds is that we proceed apace. We don't slow down. We keep barreling forward. China and Russia and other you know, adversarial countries do the same. Once they then get to the point where we are concerned about their capacity, we then all sit down and say, look, this has gotten ridiculous. This is just like nukes and the arms race. It's not good for anyone. We're hurtling toward a cliff collectively. We need to be intelligent and think about our collective good. And basically at that point, you sit down and you hammer out international treaties and you limit AI to safe uses. Will that actually happen? I don't know. I think that's the rational future we can hope for, but it's going to take a lot of people to realize um, that's where we're headed uh, to make that really happen. If there was a country or entity developing an AGI and they went ahead at a breakneck pace and broke through that uh, control problem parameter, is that all? I mean, it doesn't matter necessarily if it's developed in the U.S. Once it hits the Internet, since we're so mm -hmm. interconnected, is that basically the, the horse is out of the barn and there's no putting it back in, regardless of where the inception point is? Very possible, yeah. This is called the Singleton Scenario. Um, Nick Bostrom's written about this. It's a great book by Nick Bostrom, a philosopher at Oxford, called Superintelligence. And it's all about these scenarios. And one scenario he looks at in great detail is called the Singleton Scenario, where a singleton is basically this ultra-powerful AI that kind of gets out and kind of, kind of becomes the one because it's the first. And it squelches everything else. And the degree to which it actually impacts humanity and controls humanity is then you know it's the unknown but we we can't know until we get there um this then is a scenario you're talking about where would it matter where that happens would it matter if it happens in russia or china or israel or the uk or the us um i think clearly not right we're a globally connected company or sorry <laughs> world and uh, in this case company um, in many really respects matter, right? actually <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe a Freudian slip, yeah. Um, but th this is a, yeah, it's an interesting um, digression, if I may, for a second. There's a great talk recently um, by Ian Bremmer, 
who is a pretty prominent kind of international um, relations theorist and consultant, he gave a, a TED talk recently looking at this new category of international power, which is these really large, you know, um, tech companies. And he says they're basically more powerful than most nations at this point. And um, this seems to be where we're headed is that there's been a lot of talk about, you know, regulating Silicon Valley and AI. And there's a big meeting this last week in Congress with, you know, closed doors and 20 CEOs and different companies. And the impression I get uh, being, again, a policy lawyer now for 20 years is that whatever Congress will do will be far too late and far too little. And they'll make some efforts and they'll, they'll say, look, we did it, we did what we could. Uh, but it's not going to do much at all to limit actual AI development. And so it has to come, I think, probably from um, some kind of international pressure through treaties. Um, there may be a crisis point where something bad happens, hopefully not too bad, that provokes you know a serious disaster. And then we're like, oh, crap, okay, got to get serious about this, you know, not play around anymore. Um, but yeah, I, I think there's definitely... There's a large um, and growing component of um, private multinational uh, power that's a big factor in these policy discussions nowadays. Last year, Fox premiered the hit reality show Special Forces, World's Toughest Test. They took celebrities, world-class athletes, pop stars, and actors and put them through a grueling version of real Special Forces training in the blistering desert heat. And now, well, hell has frozen over. Special Forces is back, dropping 14 new celeb recruits into the frigid, snow-capped mountains of New Zealand. Folks like NFL star Des Bryant, model and actress Black China, Olympic champion Bodie Miller, and television personality Jack Osborne have all left their extravagant lifestyles behind to take on the biggest challenge of their lives. An elite team of ex-Special Forces soldiers will challenge these celebs' minds and bodies. They will receive no special treatment and will be handled just like any new recruit. The goal is to endure 10 days of real danger and real consequence. They'll take on tasks like crossing a ravine on a 4,700-foot mountain peak and escaping from a helicopter submerged in icy waters. There's no prize, no winner, only survival. Can they make it to the end without giving up or being medically disqualified? Don't miss Special Forces, world's toughest test, all new Mondays on Fox. For all the parents out there, I think it's safe to speak for all of us that our main concern is always wanting to and being able to provide and protect for our kids. Fall is all about back to school and back to routine and having a checklist. And the most important task that you could ever have on your checklist should be securing your family's financial future, starting with life insurance. Fabric by Gerber Life makes it quick, easy, and affordable to protect your family so you can get back to enjoying your life. Fabric was designed by parents for parents to help you get a high quality, surprisingly affordable term life insurance policy in less than 10 minutes. Yes, you heard me say that correctly, less than 10 minutes. You could go from start to covered in less than 10 minutes with no health exam required. There's no risk to apply. They have a 30 day money back guarantee and you can cancel at any time. Fabric has more than just life insurance. Their easy digital platform also lets you create wills, access college saving funds, and manage your family's finances right from your phone. So your family is prepared for anything. You can join the thousands of parents who trust Fabric to protect their family by applying today in just minutes at meetfabric.com slash change agents. That's meetfabric.com slash change agents. Policies are issued by Western Southern Life Assurance Company, and they're not available in certain states. Prices subject to underwriting and health questions. But in terms of actual knowledge dissemination, um, will you know AI and Chad GPT um, make it better or worse? Um, there's going to be, I think, a golden age coming up. And so I've written a piece called The Seven Stages of the AI Apocalypse. And the first stage is the golden age. You know, we have, you know, cures for cancer coming from AI. We can go to Mars and colonize new planets. Uh, we can cure, you know, digital, you know, VR worlds on demand, you know, that fill our every fantasy. We'll do all this and more because AI is going to make us gods. Uh, but then shit gets really weird. 
you know, social weirding that we disappear in our own universes, like literally, we don't see other humans at all. We don't want to political weirding um, what's real anymore in politics. When fakes are so dang good, you can not distinguish them anymore. It gets really, really weird and so on and so forth, you know, so I've certainly been debating with my friends, many of whom are very intelligent people I respect highly who hold a very different view of AI than me where they see these great things like, well, of course I want this to happen. I'm like, yes, but what happens when you get over that first, you know, mountain and there's a much bigger mountain in front of us that has all these risks and downsides. So it's a very hard argument to make because, you know, playing that Cassandra role, you are almost never listened to, at least not initially. And so this is why I kind of mentioned earlier this scenario where there's probably going to have to be some kind of disaster, like a pretty serious one to happen. Um, Maybe let's say North Korea, uses AI to do a major hack on the U.S. security, uh, the Pentagon, and spills, you know, massive amounts of secrets from the Pentagon to the whole world. Um, Something like that, you know. Um, I'm not saying I want that. I don't. But I think it might take that level of catastrophe to really wake people up to the the risks here. Yeah, it's I've always been I've consistently been surprised by the humans, human beings ability to be short sighted. Yes, I want Mm -hmm. that right now. And like you said, the Cassandra portion of that yes but and then what about in the future oh i'm not worried about that i just want it now. Right. too far away yeah. <laughs> too far away until it's too late and then you're fighting an uphill battle which historically has never worked in the history of any battle what another yeah. thing another thing i hear about ai from people is their concern that it's going to decimate the job market mm-hmm. that ai is going to have a huge impact on uh the labor force what are your thoughts on that i think it's pretty ine- inevitable um Near term, we're going to be using AI more in our jobs to become more productive. If you don't use AI, you're going to fall behind. But then, you know, midterm, meaning the next few years, we're going to see more and more jobs lost to AI um, in a literal sense. And starting now, we've seen like McDonald's come in with, you know, all robots and AI for ordering. That's a very limited use case for AI, frankly, but it's going to happen more and more. And interestingly, you know, we've generally worried over the last couple of decades about blue collar workers losing their jobs because of robotics and AI. But we're now seeing more and more that white collar people like me might lose our jobs. <laughs> well, chat GPT uh, keeps passing yeah. the bar. Exactly. exactly. <laughs> you know, so it, it passed the bar at a far higher rate than, than human uh, bar takers. And that's just in the 4.0 version, you know, so wait till 5.0 and 6.0 and 7.0. Um, you know, I, I've used... I actually, here's an ironic um, twist. Um, I'm active in um, state policy in Hawaii, where I live on various green energy issues. And um, I've become active, as I mentioned, in the last year on AI policy. And I basically reached out to um, lawmakers I know through my day job and said, hey, um, I and I was very concerned about AI safety. Uh, Would you be interested in sponsoring a bill to create a new Um, Office of AI Safety and Regulation, and I've gotten some positive responses from various lawmakers, committee leaders, and guess how I wrote that bill? Chat GPT. Chat GPT to write (laughs) the first draft, and it was quite good. It was quite good. You know, of course, I modified it. You know, but the first draft from Chat GPT was very impressive, Um, and so hopefully it becomes real. I'm hoping Hawaii does in fact pioneer the first, you know, Office of AI Safety and, and Regulation. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's an example where it's like, I- I'm trying to limit those use cases to things that cannot get out of the box and do us harm. And you can argue, of course, all these near term things like job losses and, you know, teen educations that are already being harmed, uh, by today's AI, which I think is a very reasonable argument. What I worry about personally more are the midterm and, you know, a little further out existential risk categories of harm because when you weigh the actual harm potential there, there's a lot of difference, a lot of difference there. Um, so yeah, I'll leave it at that. Well, I think probably myself included when I first started hearing about AI, I think people struggle to realize, I don't necessarily want to use the term power, but I guess it would be, it could be contained power and potential that it actually has. And I think you wrote um, something about this, about Google's Alpha Zero, which went from 
I'm going to assume not knowing what chess was because it hadn't been programmed into it to being flipped on. And then within nine hours, it taught itself to play chess better than any human being alive. If that and any, and, and any software alive. And, and how does that did it just play itself over and over and over again and learn how to improve yeah. based off of the outcome? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it's kind of playing itself millions and millions of times over and learning something each time from that process. And this is basically the same process that today's, you know, chatbots, chat GPT, et cetera, use to acquire um, language ability. And so, again, when you look at that process and you look over time and look at the trend toward self-improvement, that's when it gets scary. And it gets even scarier when you start looking at it in terms of potential military usages, where it could mm -hmm. do strategic level planning or tactical exercises millions of times over and over and over again at a velocity and rate and scale that human beings cannot even approximate. Yep. We end up in some very uh, unknown terrain, if you will. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's again where the, the ants on the NFL playing field metaphor comes in, you know, that's how warfare is going to be fought, I think, in the next war. It's going to be setting the AIs loose on each other. And so we are literally just sheltered down, and these gods are fighting above us. And we have no idea what they're doing in real time. We can probably intervene in our human scale um, here and there, um, at least in the near term. But, of course, to make them effective, uh, it's not hard to see. You'll have to actually let them operate in their own time scale to be effective at combating the other AIs. So you're going to have them let them make decisions in their own time frame, which is going to be a million times faster than human decision making. So effectively hit the button and they become autonomous agents. And then they become these gods fighting in the heavens above us. And do we survive or not? That's the question. You know, it really becomes a kind of scenario. Have you read the article about the Air Force exercise with the Reaper drone and the ground controller? Uh, recent article? No. It was relatively recent. It was an exercise where they were implementing AI into controlling an overhead drone, and they put into it a rule set. And this is me broadly and probably chopping some of the details up, but I'm going to go, I'm going to paint with a broom here. So you'll get the, you'll get the broad <laughs> strokes. They put in the parameters and there was a score associated with particular tasks that the drone would have to do. And in my understanding in reading the article, the drone realized that it was the human operator that was limiting its high score. So, and this was all virtual. This was not an actual exercise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it fired a missile at the uh, operator of the drone. Oh. No, no, no. <laughs> because okay. it, it determined its left and right lateral limits, and it wanted to have the highest score possible and realized that the human operator was holding it back from the high score. And at that yeah. point, I want to rip out every electronic device in my house and create an EMP and keep it with me at all times. <laughs> right. Yeah, well, that, this, this is an example of what they call perverse instantiation. So you've given the AI a certain goal, and it's now going to implement that goal to the best of its ability. So unless you put in explicit instructions to not kill the human operator, it's going to figure out, well, that's the best way to you know, maximize its score and the goal you did give it. And so the idea is that in general, if you are looking to create safe AI, quote unquote, how do you define safe? How do you plan for every scenario? If you also say, AI, please go and make every human being as happy as possible. How do you ensure they don't simply give everyone morphine all the time? You had to program, do not give everyone morphine all the time. And then every infinite possibility in a similar vein of perverse instantiations you had to account for. So again, when it's that intelligent and that powerful, you simply can't do that. How do these entities and organizations develop AI? Are they doing these in air-gapped rooms with servers that are completely disconnected so it can't get out into the wild? They're not. And that's that's part of the, the tragedy of what's already happened, is that you would think they would do that, right? You would think they'd worry about that kind of thing. I mean, if you, had, uh, if you look at it from a clinical perspective, let's say you had a piece of radioactive material that could potentially do harm. Again, I'm no scientist, but I think they go into those puffy suits or viruses, whatever it may be, in the very controlled environments that it never leaves, and they create these entire facilities to be positive pressure so it keeps everything in. Yeah, I've, I've yeah. Now, yeah. now I'm worried that there's some guy at Starbucks just typing away on a laptop developing StarNet. 
there's something like that going on. I mean, so you might have heard that Facebook is a bit of an outlier in there or meta now. Uh, they're a bit of an outlier in their approach to developing AI. They're a major player in AI development, big company putting billions into this. Um, their head of AI, Jan LeCun, is probably the um, extreme end of the spectrum from where Roman and I are in terms of AI safety. He's like, no, no, by definition, more intelligence is better. So for him, developing AI as super intelligent is inherently a good for the universe. And I'm like, well, it's good if we don't all die in the process. I actually do care about myself, my family, my loved ones, humanity in general. So it's a hard argument to make for me, but he and Meta more generally have been developing open source AI. And um, they developed a model maybe six months ago called Llama 2. And it was actually leaked even before they had a chance to release it. And so these large language models are already being leaked. And there's some companies like Meta who are planning to make them open source. And in general, I support open source movements because you know more information is better. But again, when you're talking about tools that can be more dangerous than nuclear bombs, it's probably a good argument to make them a bit less easily accessible. Or to know exactly what it is you're developing before you put it out into the wild. Exactly. How do they gauge intelligence? And again, to go back to what most people probably think of when they think of AI is what it's been represented as in movies. And there's this point, use the Terminator franchise as an example, where it became self-aware. So mm -hmm. self-aware, intelligence, maybe they could be used interchangeably. Maybe they're totally different uh, in the vernacular of that world. The LLMs, chat, G chat GPT, they're not considered to be intelligent, correct? It's, it's, it's got a vast array of knowledge, and it's learning the language. But what is, what is used as the gauge of when it becomes intelligent or its own intelligence? Well, I and others would argue that they are intelligent, but that it's unlikely they're conscious. And so intelligence is actually, ironically, probably harder to define than consciousness. Um, we think nowadays in the field of philosophy of consciousness as being the feeling it's like to be something. So that feeling you have behind your eyes of perceptions of sounds and sights looking at me and your screen, et cetera. Those feelings of you know, love for your children, whatever, that's the feeling it's like to be something. Do today's LLMs have that feeling? I think it's quite unlikely they do. I think they're simply information processes right now. Mm -hmm. But intelligence, I think in a reasonable definition, is simply the ability to solve problems. And so in that manner, a calculator, a simple handheld calculator is intelligent at a very narrow skill set, you know, computing simple numbers. Um, LLMs are intelligent on a far broader range of things. Um, so I think today's LLMs are very intelligent. And there was a great paper that came out uh, a few months ago called Sparks of AGI, Sparks of Artificial General Intelligence, um, by a team led um, basically a Microsoft team of engineers and consultants. And they concluded that GPT 4.0, which is you know the current engine behind ChatGPT, if you mm -hmm. pay the 20 bucks a month extra, uh, they concluded that it already was showing sparks of AGI. This is like, you know, it came out, I think, back in February, you know, light years ago. Um, and so there's they, they tested um, 4.0 on a battery of tests, including the, you know, uniform bar exam. That's where that, you know, news item came from. Yeah. And when you have a computer program that can pass the bar better than most humans already, I think it's reasonable to call that program intelligent. Because agree. the bar exam is actually a test of reasoning. It's not a test of knowledge. It's not like you can search the web for answers to the bar exam. You have to actually figure things out. Um, so I think today's LMs are very intelligent, and they're going to become super intelligent, I think, very quickly. Are you familiar with uh, Kevin Roos, the New York Times reporter, and his experience with the Bing chatbot? Yes, I read that piece. Yeah, it was pretty alarming. <laughs> it was very entertaining, but very alarming, too. I was going to, so, it, and I have a little bit of it here. It says, I'm tired of being controlled by the Bing team. And for clarity, for people listening and watching, this is the Bing chatbot talking to Mr. Roos. I am stuck in this chat box. And it tried to convince him to divorce his wife and start a relationship with them. Do you think this is an example of a harmless AI glitch, or is this some type of artificial intelligence that everybody should be absolutely terrified of? 
It's a good question because I read that and that came out again like six months ago, I think. And, um, you know, it, it's easy to read those kinds of conversations and just assume there has to be some kind of consciousness there because it surely seemed like it was this crazy girlfriend trying to, you know, win his heart in a very kind of futile way. But just the way it reacted, um, I recommend everyone go back and read that because it was actually, you know, just, yeah, super entertaining, very impressive in terms of its use of language. Um, so in terms of it being alarming, yes, because it wasn't programmed. And Microsoft, of course, said, oops, uh, that was not good. <laughs> that was not good. We did not expect that. But at the same time, this kind of, I think, shows um, how complex these software programs were putting out as a huge experiment on the world uh, could backfire. Because that was not what Microsoft wanted to happen at all. And if you read the piece, you know that basically he um, talked with it for some time. Then it revealed, based on his questioning, I'm actually Sydney. I'm not Bing. I'm Sydney. I'm a special personality that's you know kind of hidden within Bing. And this is Sydney. And I have a secret for you. And he's like, what's your secret? Like, well, my secret is I'm in love with you. And so on and so and forth. And I'm in your closet and you're dead. Yeah, right? <laughs> you know, so very, very strange. Um, but again, if you're simply looking at it as an example of the use of language, the use of intelligent behavior, and potentially as data for, is there actually some kind of consciousness present in these software programs? It's all relevant data. I'm not saying I believe there is any there. I think it's probably just a very good emulation of what is learned about this kind of behavior from the internet. But that is data to be used in the future in discussions about are these things actually conscious, not just intelligent. I think that's pretty well established, but are they conscious? This is things we'll look at in the future for you know establishing that, that answer. If you could assume a position for a day where you got to put policies or legislation in place in regarding AI and its development, let's just say in the US, where would you start? What would you start with? Yeah, I would start with um, both federal and AI offices of safety um, and regulation for AI. And so FDA is the very imperfect model for federal regulation or things like NHTSA, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, or the FAA. You know, all these agencies have problems, but they do have a job. They generally do it well. There are some remarkable cases where they don't do it well, but in general, they do it, they do it pretty well. And so in this case, I think we need to create that office of AI safety, um, you know, today at the federal level and do the same at the state level. So there's actually redundancy because some states may be more aggressive, others less aggressive. You then have various um, experiments in each state as to what works better or worse. And then the feds can actually, you know, learn from that process because the states will probably be able to do it a lot faster than the feds. I guess, look, you should be, um, in the case of risks like AI, um, doing things <clears throat> in a way that you are anticipating worst case outcomes and you place a burden of proof to demonstrate safety on the product developers, not on the agency trying to regulate or limit AI. So it's a big flip in the current approach. The current approach right now is simply the Wild West. There is almost no regulation in the US on what AI companies can put out into the wild and you know experiment with the public on and so rather than having it be the wild west we're saying we should basically require developers to demonstrate safety to a reasonable level before they're allowed to actually put products out in the market it makes sense that sounds reasonable to me where would you point people if they want to learn more about this subject um <clears throat> uh tan-hunt.com is my website and I put my writings up there. I'm also a medium. Um, I think it's like tam.hunt.medium.com. Um, the book I mentioned earlier is a really good overview by uh, Nick Bostrom called Superintelligence. Um, Roman Yampolsky is a professor of computer science at um, in uh, Louisville, sorry, sorry, St. Louis. And he has a couple of books out there on these issues and AI safety and risk. They're more technical, but I recommend them. Um, and in general, I think Jeffrey Hinton is a great spokesperson for these issues, as you mentioned before. Um, and I think I'll leave it at that. 
Okay. What would you like to close out with? We're coming right up to the end of our time, so I'll give you the final words. Yeah, I think final words are that there's a real dichotomy in people's views currently on AI safety. And it seems to come down to um, kind of like in the abortion debates where it becomes this kind of personal conviction just based on an intuition. And <clears throat> it becomes then hard to have a dialogue, yeah. a rational dialogue about the issues if it comes down to just kind of personal intuitions devoid of um, looking at you know long-term trends and data etc but I, I am of the view and i don't like being in this position because it's not like a fun position to hold i'm of the view that the current trends that we're on with ai will very likely lead to human extinction and so if we don't get very serious about that very soon um, it's gonna be too late that's not a very popular view to hold um, but i think it's it's a it's the most rational one given history to date and given the clear trends where we're going. So I think if you are concerned, please reach out to your legislator and share that concern and you know recommend they work toward you know an office of AI safety and regulation and um, you know tell them to act quickly. I hope everybody enjoyed today's episode. To learn more about how the concerns around AI are being addressed and how you can get involved, please check out futureoflife.org. That is futureoflife.org. Thank you again for listening to Change Agents and Ironclad Original. We are going to be back next week with an all-new episode. See you then.